All right, hasn't been a minute, but we'll get started. <laughs> um, okay, so really quickly, um, we wanted to give you some information about how to participate in the webinar. So everyone is welcome to participate. We're going to have a question and answer at the end of the webinar, at the end of the presentation. Um, and staff, uh, I or Evan will call on participants. Um, you will need to ask questions in the Q&A section, which is the box at the bottom of your screen. There's also time for people who called in by phone to ask questions. So if you called in by phone, you'll need to press star six to unmute. Um, we ask that you keep your questions brief so that we can have as many questions as possible. And um, please be respectful about opinions and avoid obscenities and hurtful language. So we are recording this webinar and it will be posted online. So if you have uh, want to follow up again, you can watch it at any time um, on our website. So today's webinar, um, we're going to talk about three main sections. It's the first is the introduction to historic preservation very briefly also a brief history of historic preservation, and then what does landmark preservation do? So our main areas of work are to identify, protect, incentivize, and to plan. So what is historic preservation? Um, in Denver, so uh, Denver Landmark Preservation was established by city council in 1967. And in our ordinance, it says, it is the sense of the council that the economic, cultural, and aesthetic standing of the city cannot be maintained or enhanced by disregarding the historical, architectural, and geographic heritage of the city, and by ignoring the destruction or defacement of such cultural assets. So it's very clear that the historic preservation is an important um, aspect of the work of the city, and um, we need to preserve the, the buildings and the sites and the places that are important to all Denverites. So some of the things that we do are to protect, enhance, and perpetuate the use of structures and districts. This would um, allow the reuse of buildings or the continued use of buildings, <clears throat> excuse me, and the preservation of the exterior, largely street-facing sides of the building. We also um, aim to, <clears throat> excuse me, foster civic pride in the beauty and accomplishments of the past. So we all um, recognize the beauty and accomplishments and um, place of gathering that is Civic Center Park, but we also recognize the importance of the Rossonian, which is the jewel of Five Points neighborhood, and also some of our um, historic neighborhoods throughout the city. One of our goals is also to stabilize and improve the aesthetics and economic vitality and values of structures and districts. So there's no doubt that Larimer Square is a wonderful um, historic, <clears throat> excuse me, historic place within our city, but is also a real economic powerhouse for the city, as is a newly um, restored and revitalized Union Station, which has helped a lot to revitalize that portion of the lower downtown um, and Central Platte Valley neighborhood. And finally, we um, our goal is to educate, um, stimulate, and for the education stimulation and welfare of the people of the city, we want people to understand how people in the city uh, use these buildings and, and sites. So the Molly Brown House is a, a really important example of that, but also buildings such as Smith's Chapel, which is in the middle, which is one of our newest landmarks that is an important site for the, the history of the Chicano movement. And then the um, Justina Ford House, which is on the right, and she was such an important part of the Five Points community and the, and the African-American community. Now I'm going to turn it over to Evan, who will um, give us a brief history of pre historic preservation. Thanks, Jen. Uh, as Jen said, my name is Evan Shuckler. I'm an associate city planner with Denver Landmark, uh, Denver Landmark Preservation. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about a, a brief history of preservation. Uh, we don't want to linger on this too much, but we thought it might be interesting to see the origins of the preservation movement um, within the country, but then also how Denver fits within that context. So we're beginning with some early history. It's, there's certainly no um, single beginning to the history of preservation, but uh, a pretty significant event was in 1856 when um, a group of uh, well-to-do women founded the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, which had the goal of preserving uh, Mount Vernon, the historic home of uh, George Washington. Um, and that was one of the very first instances of, of private individuals coming together to save a building. Um, and that's taking place at a time when our country was going through a lot of changes with the Industrial Revolution and as well to lead up to the Civil War. So you'll see that there often are these big periods of change that then lead to um, rebirth of preservation. So a little bit later in 1879, History Colorado 
was established um, very early within the history of the state, but it was specifically founded as a, uh, a museum to um, record and present the history of, of Colorado. Um, then we'll jump ahead to 1931, uh, and Charleston, South Carolina um, establishes its own uh, municipal preservation ordinance. And that was actually the first municipal preservation ordinance established in the country. So, um, you know, there's actually a pretty long history of cities having um, this goal of preserving their history. So next we're gonna jump to some mid-century history. Um, and uh, this again is a period of, of um, change within the country and, and also within Denver that I think led to another big shift within the preservation movement. So um, in 1961, the Tabor Grand Opera House was demolished here in Denver. And uh, you know, I think that is a loss that is still felt today in terms of a, you know, a fantastic historic building that was, was torn down. And it's just one of many that was lost to urban renewal in the post-war era. Um, a couple of years later is the demolition of Penn Station in New York, City, um, one of the most famous demolitions in the country, I think, uh, that actually was a, became a national catalyst for um, preservation movement. And three years later, you see in 1966, the establishment of the uh, National Historic Preservation Act, which is um, a sort of federal law that I think really establishes preservation at the federal level as we know it today. Um, and we, we won't talk too much about this later, but this is where um, particular Stipulations are put in place that say that federal money should not be spent to detrimentally impact historic resources, um, which led, leads to a review process that um, we actually participate in now, where whenever the government, the federal government is spending money, um, they have to research whether or not that money will negatively impact historic resources. And if it will, then you know, mitigation re um, efforts should be put in place to minimize the, the negative effects of, of those losses. So it was a very, it was a major shift in how preservation um, happened in the US. And just one year later, um, Denver Landmark Preservation is established um, by an ordinance passed by city council. Um, and actually 1967 is, is fairly early for a municipal um, preservation ordinance. We established that Charleston, that there's up in 1931, which is by far the earliest, but some other major cities um, Philadelphia, 1955, a little bit earlier, but New York is only in 1967, so Denver is really right on, on their heels in terms of having this, um, this new local preservation law. Um, some other local cities, 1976 is when Fort Collins establishes their preservation ordinance, or excuse me, 1971, and then uh, Boulder in 1974, I believe are the dates. Um, and then a couple of um, uh, landmark designations uh, in 1970, Larimer Square, which Jen previously mentioned, was designated as our as the city's first historic district. Uh, and there you can see the little thumbnail with uh, Dana Crawford, who really uh, revitalized that um, district, standing in front of some of our buildings. And then 1971, the Molly Brown House was designated another well-known Denver landmark. We also wanted to mention, uh, going back to the national level, in 1983, the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Historic Preservation are adopted. Um, and that's a pretty major milestone in, in preservation as well, because um, the, those standards are um, the first time that the federal government really set out some guidelines for how people should treat historic properties. And um, those, those have been amended, but they're still in use today. And they form the foundations for a lot of different design guidelines, including um, our own local design guidelines. Now moving more into recent history, in 1990, uh, the state of Colorado passed a uh, preservation tax credit, uh, which is something we'll discuss a little bit um, later. But you know that, again, marks a shift where there's this acknowledgment that for um, the successful reuse of historic properties that um, you know, some financial resources need to be made available to, to encourage that work. In 1995, this is actually national, but, but also international, um, Docomomo is established, uh, which is, this is a mouthful, but it was the International Organization for the uh, Committee for Documenting and Conserving Buildings, Sites, and Neighborhoods of the Modern Movement. I apologize for the mouthful, but it's an acknowledgement that uh, in the 90s, we're starting to see a shift away from, you know, just colonial architecture and history on the East Coast, but and then Victorian um, and early 1900s history here in Denver to seeing the importance of buildings from the modern movement. Um, 
And for instance, uh, Denver in 2019, we designated uh, Cable Land, which was our first postmodern um, landmark. And that was uh, actually built in 1986. So as ever, history is kind of nipping at our heels. Um, and things that may not seem so far away are, are really historic. Uh, in 2016, Denver established its demolition ordinance, which was um, you know, in response to the loss of some pretty important buildings in the city that um, you know, many Denverites mourn the loss of. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that process, but a uh, picture there is actually a recent building that was um, partially saved through the demolition review process. Uh, that's the, Hor uh, excuse me, the Howard Mortuary uh, in the Berkeley Regis neighborhood. In 2016, the National Park Service began conducting uh, or completing, excuse me, uh, thematic studies. And specifically, they've completed some related to uh, LGBTQ history, as well as the history of Asian Americans and African Americans, um, and there also uh, is a lot of work around uh, documenting and preserving the civil rights movement and its history, um, and that's really a part of a, a recent shift in preservation to, uh, as we say, tell the full story, to sort of go beyond the traditional narratives and, and think about different communities um, and different histories that maybe have been ignored. Uh, and then the last uh, point on our timeline is uh, just in 2019, there, uh, Denver went through a major um, update to our ordinance, which changed some of our rules. The main goals of which were um, establishing some new cultural criteria, which again is building on this idea of telling the full story, the full history of, of Denver and of the United States. Um, so as to create a more inclusive register of historic places there were also some changes to the demolition review, um, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later. Um, and that really is just to acknowledge that, you know, preservation has a long history, as, as we can see from this timeline, but it's also always evolving. Um, and Denver is always trying, I think, to be at the at the forefront and, and keep up to date with our policies. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about different types of designation. Um, and these really break down into three levels, national, state, and local. Um, so Denver landmark preservation is the local level and our landmarks are um, designated by city council. But then at the national level, you have national historic landmarks, which are really kind of the, the highest honors that can be uh, provided to a historic site. Um, if I can quote from the, the rules of that, they possess exceptional value or quality in illustrating and interpreting the heritage of the United States. Um, next is the National Register of Historic Places, which is again buildings that are, are generally seen as being at a national level, but um, are not, don't quite rise to the level of an NHL. For reference, um, there are about 2,600 NHL National Historic Landmarks, two of which are in Denver. And uh, the National Register, there are about 95,000 properties in the United States, about 300 of which are in Denver. So you can see the difference in the levels. The state of Colorado also has a register um, and it lines up pretty closely with the national register. A lot of those buildings are listed. So as a sort of activity to think about how there are these different levels of designation um, that are not applied in a sort of like a coherent way necessarily, we have uh, four different sites um, in Denver. So the first of which is Red Rocks, which many of you I'm sure recognize. Uh, and this is actually it is a national historic landmark. It's on the national register and it's also on the state and local register. So that's like this truly exceptional historic site that kind of checks all the boxes. Below that is Tom's Diner, which uh, some of you may remember from some of the news coverage about that um, in 2019. Um, and that actually is only listed on the national register of historic places. It's not locally designated. And then next is um, Cuba Cuba, which is a, a restaurant in the Golden Triangle neighborhood. Um, and that is a structure that is actually only locally listed. Um, it doesn't have any sort of national um, designation. And then below that is, um, uh, I think I, we don't actually know which specific house it is, but it, it's one of the grand houses of Denver and it could just as easily be along East 7th Avenue, but it's actually located in Park Hill in a national register historic district. So that is um, a house that doesn't have any local protections or designation. So, um, thinking about these different levels of designation, um, the, we really have different agencies and organizations that are involved in those processes, and they also align to those three levels of federal, state, and 
uh, and local. So at the federal level, there is a governmental agency, the National Park Service, um, and then there's also a national nonprofit, which is the National Trust for Historic Preservation. At the state level, we have History Colorado, uh, which is the State Historic Preservation Office, which is kind of a, an intermediary actually between the local and the national. And then we also have a statewide preservation advocacy organization, Colorado Preservation Inc. And then uh, the city of Denver also has its own preservation agency, Denver Landmark Preservation, and we have a local nonprofit, uh, Historic Denver, which is, you know, focused solely on uh, local preservation issues. So, and what's interesting too, I think, is that all three of those levels have a presence in Denver. So there's National Park Service offices, as well as History Colorado, of course, and the National Trust also has an office in Denver. So this brings us to Denver Landmark Preservation uh, and who we are. So there is a staff of 11 professionals, uh, which includes one dedicated inspector. Um, and uh, we also wanted to point out that um, the, the professionals at the staff level all have um, master's degrees in this field. And, and many of us have uh, work experience outside of just uh, government work. Some of us have worked in architecture offices and in the private sector before coming to work for the city. We also have two commissions, the Landmark Preservation Commission, which is a nine member volunteer commission. Um, again, all professionals, um, a mix of licensed architects, landscape architects. You know, we have a number of um, architectural historians and historians who have PhDs in their field, um, as well as a mix of property owners, residents of the district, um, and uh, people of some other professions. Uh, and then there's also the Lower Downtown Design Review Commission, the LDERC, which is also nine members appointed by the mayor. It has more of a focus on including members specifically from that district. And the purview of the LDERC is limited to the Lower Downtown Historic District. The LPC covers um, the rest of the city. So now that we've covered, um, you know, why, what is preservation and, and why is it a part of the city government? And then as well, a brief history to, to think about the evolution of, of um, preservation in Denver and the country. What is it that landmark preservation does? How do you typically interact with us on uh, a more day-to-day -day basis? So as Jen said at the beginning, we've, we've really broken this down into four um, headers, which are the identification of historic resources, the protection of those resources, incentivizing people to um, to preserve those and use them and then also planning about you know how um, resources might be used in the future in Denver. So we're going to start with historic designation. Um, at the moment Denver has 351 individually designated landmarks and we have 56 historic districts. Um, a few of them are quite large but most of them are actually fairly small. I think our smallest is four properties um, for individual buildings within the district. But all in all, it makes up about 4% of Denver's buildings, so 1 in 25 structures. This map um, shows you uh, the locations of the different districts and individual landmarks. It may be a bit difficult to see, but you'll see some small red dots, which are the buildings individually designated. And then, of course, the larger colored areas are the historic districts. Um, and you'll see that the color of the different areas relates to the era in which they were designated. So blue is some of our earliest and uh, being in the 1970s, I think. And then red is uh, some of the more recent um, designations in the, in the 2010s. So it is interesting looking at this map that there's actually um, a, uh, you know, the historic resources are really concentrated around the, the historic core of the city, the downtown. And especially the earliest designation, most of the blue districts. Um, but you know, over time, they have the districts have grown outward as again different eras have of history have become or uh, have become historic. And so a lot of the later districts are following the routes of the um, streetcar suburbs, which was you know a sort of early 1900s phase of development in Denver. Um, you know, and there's a lot of the city that isn't covered, but you know, we, I think we just haven't gotten around to understanding the history in those places. So the districts that will continue to grow out from the center, from the historic core. So um, how does a building become a, a, a historically designated? How does it become a Denver landmark? Uh, it has to meet a series of requirements. So the first of which is that it has to maintain historic and physical integrity. Uh, integrity is always a kind of tricky 
thing to explain in preservation. Um, it, it doesn't mean structural integrity. We talk about it in terms of uh, the ability of something to convey why it's significant, to convey its significance. So, um, you know, here we have the um, the the Coliseum building, the Stadium Arena at the National Western Center, and you have the historic photo which shows how it appeared, um, you know, after construction. And then there's a current photo. And while there have been some changes to it, the building retains integrity because you can still recognize it as that historic building, and you can still understand what it was and that it was a, um, you know, an, import, uh, an arena for the presentation of, of the livestock during the stock show. So in addition to maintaining integrity, properties have to be 30 years old. They can be younger, but if we are gonna designate something less than 30, it has to be really important. It has to have exceptional significance. Um, and then next, we have a series of 10 criteria which cover um, history, architecture, geography, and, and culture. And a building has to meet three out of 10 of those um, criteria. Uh, buildings or sites also have to relate to a historic context. So, you know, we have to understand how this building fits into the larger history of Denver. And then once someone has put together an application that, you know, shows that the building meets those four requirements and has all the right criteria, it's reviewed by the Landmark Preservation Commission which then makes a recommendation to city council. And city council is actually the body that makes the final determination about whether or not a building should be a landmark. Um, there will be a presentation if you wanna learn more about designation on February 18th. So please uh, look out for that and uh, join for that. Um, in the realm of identification, we also have, as we mentioned, a citywide demolition review. Um, and basically whenever uh, someone wants to demolish a structure in Denver, uh, it's first reviewed by Landmark Preservation. We have 10 business days to do some research and, and determine whether or not a property has the potential to be a landmark. If we find that it does have potential, it's posted for notice. And on the left there, you can see um, a property with its uh, posting sign showing that it uh, had the potential to be significant. At that point, the community or a member of council can come forward actually and uh, try to submit an application to designate. Uh, as you can see from this pie chart, um, showing some data from 2020, 96%, um, over 96% of the demolitions that we review are actually approved by staff without any posting. So it's just under 3% um, of properties actually get posted, or right around 3% of properties get posted for notice. And of those very few end up becoming landmarks being passed by uh, council, but not all of them are then demolished. Um, as we mentioned before, the Howard Mortuary was actually not designated by council as part of the demolition review, but uh, an agreement was reached outside of the demo review process that allowed the building to be saved. And so it still exists and the current owners have now applied to designate it. If you have interest in learning about uh, more about um, demolition review, there'll also be a webinar on September 9th. So you can keep an eye out for that. So now we're moving from um, identification into the protection sort of part of our mission, uh, which largely consists of design review. So when buildings are, um, alterations to buildings within the historic districts generally require review by landmark preservation. Um, the way we review those is through our design guidelines. Um, here you can see the cover of it. The, the current version was adopted in 2016 um, and the idea of the guidelines is to provide a clear, predictable regulation for how buildings are allowed to change and what alterations current owners can make to their historic buildings. It addresses a wide range of topics. Um, as you can see from our sort of little table of context here, it addresses actually preserving the buildings, but also things like additions to buildings, um, new buildings on you know, vacant lots in the historic districts, as well as site and landscape design and signage for some of our commercial districts. Um, the guidelines also feature character defining features for historic districts, for some of our historic districts. So in that you can read the character defining features and learn a little bit about, you know, what, what are things that are typical of this neighborhood? What do most of the buildings look like? Um, you know, what might be appropriate? And another thing to keep your eyes open for is we're planning to do some updates to these design guidelines in 2021. Um, and there will be a public engagement portion to that process. So um, certainly keep your eyes peeled for updates on that. To get a little more specific about what Landmark really does review, our rule of thumb is if it requires a building or zoning permit, it requires Landmark Preservation to review first. 
So that includes, again, new construction, additions, exterior alterations, window replacement, egress windows, that's something very common that, that people bring up, again, signage roofing, things that we do not review, paint colors. Um, I think a lot of people think we, we pay attention to that, but you can paint your historic house, whatever color you like. Um, general repairs and maintenance, like uh, repointing storm windows, um, things like that. Uh, and interior alterations are not under our purview, and we also don't review um, planting or trees as part of the landscape features. Um, again, we're actually going to have a series of webinars to dig into these topics a little bit more so you can look for a, another general review of design uh, review, as well as signage, windows, and new construction. So again, keep your eyes peeled for those. All right, so I'm going to finish us up. Um, one of the things that we that is a great incentive for historic preservation are the state income tax credits for um, historic rehabilitation work. So there are two types of credits. One is for residential or non-income producing properties, and another one is for commercial tax credits for income producing properties. The residential right now is set for 20% and the commercial tax credit is 25% uh, of qualified expenses. Although um, there is a provision for a 5% increase to both of those if a disaster has been declared. And currently we are um, under state of disaster because of COVID. So there is an increase, um, the residential tax credit is 25% for projects that started um, on or prior to March 10th, 2020. And the commercial tax credit is up to 30% for projects that started on those dates. And those are um, a percentage of the qualified costs. So those qualified costs may include really simple things that people are doing to their property already, like re-roofing or um, repointing their masonry, repairing their windows. Um, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing upgrades are also included in that work. And there are other, there's a whole list of um, the rehabilitation expenses that are allowed for that. We have an upcoming webinar um, on July 8th about preservation tax credits to talk also about there's a federal tax credit program um, that is very similar to the state program, but it's just for commercial um, income producing properties. We are involved with uh, neighborhood and small area plans. So landmark preservation is um, housed within the planning services department of community planning and development. And we, um, we are actively involved with our neighborhood and small area plans, such as the West Area Plan, which is um, ongoing right now, and the Loretto Heights Campus uh, Small Area Plan, which is just wrapping up um, implementation of that now. Finally, the Discover Denver survey is something that we have been involved with for several years. It's a partnership uh, between us and Historic Denver. It's a citywide survey to evaluate and, and understand the historic resources that are available, that are exist throughout the city. Uh, you can see the map on the bottom left shows the areas in yellow that we have, um, we've already surveyed. So we go neighborhood by neighborhood and, and choose them based on um, diversity of property, uh, of building stock and um, diversity of the, the geographic diversity of the city as well. Um, and we um, are currently surveying in the coal neighborhood. So you can, you can look for findings at discoverdenver.co. That's not .com, it's .co. Um, and we also are having another webinar about it on August 12th. Um, but you can, if you go to discoverdenver.co, you can find information about the program and also provide information about things that you know about your neighborhood or you know about the property that's, that you live in. And that is it. So um, now it's time to ask uh, to, for us to answer some of your questions. If you have any, you're always welcome to reach out to us um, after this. Um, for, uh, to our, you've got our website there, which is um, denvergov.org slash landmark. We also have an email address, which is the best way to reach us, which is landmark at denvergov.org. And then our phone number as well, and uh, the list of all the webinars we've discussed.